Hey, John. Nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you, too. We have our masks yeah. off now. We yeah. Plexi it's, glass. We're seeing, I'm seeing Jim's entire face for the first are. time. <laughs> Pleasure to meet you. Fun to be here. Um, congratulations on um, uh, Dead Man Dancing. It did it just recently released, Yeah, just, right? this, just this week. Just this week. Tuesday. Yeah. Right. And this is the, the second in the... The second of, of four so far. The of third, four. I've turned in the third one and I'm working on the fourth one as we speak. So, yeah, after Dead Man Dancing, I was able to sign a new contract for two more. So there would be one, two, three, four, at least. That's great. When you start with that, uh, I, I love Sheriff Cakes. She, she's, she's great. And just, uh, Sheriff, you know, from the point of view of a, of a woman, it's pretty great. And I don't see that a lot in um, some of the crime fiction that I read. Um, uh, so we started with her in Bad X was the first introduction of, of right. Heidi, right? right. Mm -hmm. um, did you know there was going to be a second book when you started writing that? No. Uh -huh. No. And, uh, so, so I, but when I, when I was able to sell this book, it was up for a two book contract. So as soon as, as soon as this was sold, I knew I had, that there was a second book coming. But when I was writing this one, no, I had no idea um, whether it would ever even be published. Yeah, I know. You know, it was some pretty challenging material in it. There were some some times in the composition of the book when I was thinking, what am I doing? If, you know, <laughs> could this really work? But yeah, it was at the time I didn't know that it would succeed. Yeah, there's a lot of not only kind of thrilling and uh, fun to read, is, is maybe, but there's, it's disturbing too, some of it. Um, and, you know, and the, uh, the same thing with Dead Man Dancing. So we're talking about some of the research that you did for this. Was it some of this uh, based more on stuff that you've actually, you know? Yeah, yeah. I, I definitely wanted to write about the area, um, the, the Cooley region in the, in the southwestern Wisconsin. And I had, I had uh, written a, a different novel that wasn't working very well and, and was at a point where I was starting over with Heidi Kick as... Um, the protagonist and I had to start from scratch and I was doing research on rural crime. You know, what kind of crime really occurs in rural areas? Is there anything unique to it? Um, what is it that um, rural law enforcement has to deal with generally? And um, I came across a study that uh, really told me what the book had to be about. And it was a study, it was an academic study of sex trafficking and sex crime. And the researchers um, asked crime enforcement leaders all across the Midwest, um, all of whom were men, or at least the vast majority of them, about sex trafficking and sex crimes in their communities. And they said they didn't have any. Um, researchers then went and asked the exact same questions of um, women's health care centers, rape crisis centers, emergency rooms, um, and all of those other kinds of services, and workers, primarily women in those fields, and heard that it was an epidemic. Um, and so that told me what I, what I needed to focus on. Um, what happens when a woman is in charge suddenly, things look differently, things that have gone uncovered, unobserved, or suddenly visible. So, so that's, that was really the thing. Yeah. She may see or, or at least prioritizing it. things, uh, believing, believing women or perhaps, you know, men in charge didn't. Um, so yeah. So. Yeah, she's kind of, it's, it's, it's fascinating too to see the, the family life of Heidi with her husband Harmon and uh, kind of a flip-flop of what we're used to seeing a lot about the home life that Harmon trying to keep the kids and, and what's going yeah, on. Yeah, he's, he's a semi-house husband who's, uh, yeah, yeah. She's got a, a, a very demanding full-time job that <laughs> yeah. comes off and takes her away from home for a long period. Yeah. So yeah, her husband kind of runs the family. Yeah, it's constant struggle in her life, it seems, in both books, but, uh, which is interesting to watch, too, her balancing her life, family. Yeah, that's yeah. the part where I, where I really connect with her. You know, people sometimes ask me, well, you know, what, what, how can you write about a female character from her point of view um, and do it successfully? And I, I have to say that it doesn't, it doesn't seem unusually challenging to me, and I think it's because I, I really connect with her across the landscape of parenthood. And, and across the landscape of trying to balance uh, a career and a family mm -hmm. um, and so forth. So I, it's, you know, that's the level on which I connect with her most. Yeah. And, you have, and you have children? I have two children, yeah, two boys. Yes. Grown up boys. Yeah, I got a boy and a girl, 24 and 21 now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because it's a similar thing when we're trying to balance. Well, I, I, write in a, I live right around the corner from here. I'm like two blocks away. I figured, away. I figured yeah built a little writing studio and so I used to say goodbye to the kids and walk to the garage every morning. Yeah. 
Yeah, like a character in your book. <laughs> yes. Right? Yeah. yeah. I don't have a writing studio, but my kids are grown up, so my whole house is absurd. I also have a, 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 a little campsite that I go to and uh, work in a camper away from everybody. That's great. So, yeah, remote writing studio. Yeah, in, in the early years, I could write at home, but once the kids were born, I just I had to get out of the you house. You know, that's interesting. That's when my writing took off when my first son was born. Yeah. Because I quit screwing around. I realized, you know, you got no time to waste. I started getting up at 4, 4.30 in the morning and writing before anybody could wake up and interrupt me. Yeah. Um, and I did that for years and years and years. That's funny. My writing schedule is very early in the morning, too. And there, there were times when I was, like, working on it but specifically 4 to 4 35 o'clock. So now I still write about 6, 6.30. Yeah. Um, and part of it, because, you know, I'm working in the theater too, our day usually begins at noon. Right. So I could get three or four hours of writing in from 6 to 10 or something like that. Right. And then still do my job. Right. Yeah, that's kind of the way it's been for me because I work in, I have an academic schedule yeah. that's not, it's pretty fluid. You know, you can, a lot of, in a lot of ways, you can decide when to do a portion of the work so yeah I would you know I don't get up at four o'clock in the morning anymore but I get up at six and yeah. work, I can work till nine usually and um, then start the rest of the day so yeah it's a, a lot of text at the end of the day I'm sure <laughs> it is for you too because you're a reader for the theater yeah you you look yeah. at your own computer screen and then you yeah you know, yeah it's funny I get you know I get I think it's like a muscle too I do believe that over the years just getting, mm -hmm. that is the writing and it's the time when your brain says now we write exactly you know and if I get three decent hours, that's that's a good day. Yeah, yeah. that's enough. Yeah, sure. yeah, sure. um, yeah. And you're right. That's it's a good. That's a good analogy to our muscle. It's something you get in. You're in shape for it, and you do it. And it's just not something you think about or have to force yourself to do. Yeah. I always thought I would like to be a late night writer. You know, with scotch and some romantic <laughs> version of yeah, it. You and cannot I, write with scotch. I, I tried to write, and then I fell asleep at the computer. I was like, no, I'm no. up early, like a dad going to his office. And, yeah. Me too. So the romantic uh, ideas of it quickly went away. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you had. So you, how long you been teaching in? Mass? Thirty-three years. Well, wow. that's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. And this is, and then um, I confess I'm new to your writing, so I've just read the last two books of yours. Right. I've not read the fly fishing. Yeah. Because I was a little nervous about doing this. I don't know if two authors have ever kind of semi-interviewed each other, but I was saying. I would just want to talk to you about fishing for the whole I, time. Well, I know, we do. We, <laughs> we could ignore that. I know, but, we, but yeah. your book is out, okay, so we'll, right. we'll get back to that. We did talk a little bit before the show, just yeah. full disclosure. Yeah. So, um, um, uh, so mm -hmm. is the four books, the book, is that correct? The, yeah, my first book is called Red Sky, Red Dragonfly, and it's a, it's a literary mystery, I guess, or literary novel set in Japan, and that's, so that was book number one, and that's unrelated to the fly fishing series, which followed that, and there are four of those, yeah. Uh-huh. And then, so, can I ask, is Heidi in the next two books also? Yes. Great. This going to be fun to watch her. What's going on? Go through her life arc. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I'm very interested. Her kids are growing up and uh, yeah. challenging her, and her marriage is challenging her. And, uh, yeah. yeah. But the work-life balance is always going to be yeah, a big part of her struggle. Can't talk. This is always hard talking about mysteries, too. There's so much I can't talk to you about. But there's some fun surprises in, uh, I found in Yeah. Um, um, but also, you know, I was saying how, how timely uh, some of the subject matter in the book is, if you, we can, uh, a little bit, not giving anything away, dealing with uh, white supremacy right. um, in yeah. particularly in rural communities. Did you do any research on that, or has uh, it been in your life? It's been in my life. I mean, it's in everybody's sure. life. Um, it's been in my life, for sure. Um, and um, it's something that I've followed closely for quite a long time, and I've always tried to find a way to write about it mm -hmm. um, with some degree of authority from my position as a, a comfortable middle class uh, white man. Um, yeah, I found a fascinating historical background to um, Vernon County, which is um, not the county where my books are set, but it's, uh, it's a real county. My books are set in a fictional county <clears throat> south of there, but um, Wisconsin, um, I don't know if I can get all the dates right, but Wisconsin, there was a, a, a something called the Fugitive Slave Act, which um, essentially, as I understand it, allowed people to hunt down fugitive slaves and yeah. turn them in for money, dead or alive kind of thing. Uh, Wisconsin never ratified that, and so Wisconsin was a destination for the Underground Railroad and um, a place um, 
in Vernon County called Cheyenne Valley was the northernmost terminus of the Underground Railroad. And so there were uh, escaped slaves living in Wisconsin and in numbers and a significant community of them. Um, and they became every part of a community and, you know, um, bakers and um, blacksmiths and so forth. And, and they uh, lived in harmony with the European immigrants that had come over here without any history of, uh, of, of slavery and didn't carry the baggage. And so there was a brief time when um, all those people lived in harmony in this small little pocket of, of the coolies, the driftless area. And um, the story that I, that I focus on in particularly is um, one of those, uh, a son of an escaped slave named Alga Shivers became a, a noted architect and builder. And he uh, was the one who, who came up with, created the idea for the round barns. I don't know, if, well, there's a round barn yeah. spring green, isn't there? Yeah. yeah, it's not one of his, but it's, um, um, and so he, he, and he basically designed these round barns where the, the cattle would come in around the outside and the food would go down the middle and the waste would go out the back. And, um, they were, he built these, he was a builder as well, and built these all over Vernon County. There's still, I think, 17 of them or so out there. So anyway, um, that's the background for Dead Man Dancing. Um, the story takes place because uh, a retired history teacher, high school history teacher, decides to write a book about the round barns and discovers uh, the background in terms of race and discovers that this, there's this history and, he, and he's asking the question, well, where have these people gone? Why are they not here anymore? Mm -hmm. um, and um, discovers in the writing of his book that there was, you know, people were intermarrying, there are people uh, still existing who have that heritage and either know it and are hiding it or don't know it. Um, and it's basically his murder and the destruction of his book that kicks off the plot. Yeah. It's, excuse me. It's, yeah, a year, many years ago, I, I wrote a play called Midnight Cry, <clears throat> which is about the Underground Railroad, which had a route through Milwaukee mm -hmm. to Racine to Chicago to Canada, mm -hmm. which is pretty fascinating. And I uh, researched that by reading actual slave narratives. It's an amazing book, which is just yeah. verbatim yeah. slave narratives, yeah. which is I read that book. Uh, uh, the American Holocaust. It's, it's yeah. horrific. Yeah. Um, Tom, but yeah, it was fascinating to learn that. I also love how you use the local geography. There's a lot of the geography local in your, in your mind, but fictionalized mm -hmm. slightly. And, uh, um, but just, I was um, in, in a, a dead man dancing, just the sense of, you know, the, the small town fairs and, you know, the very, we have all that. Is, it's just wonderful because I can, you know, we have, we have we, for folks that read this book from around here, both have, uh, we have, uh, for Pete's sake, we have summer fest, uh, Saint, you know, the fest for raising money for the Catholic school, mm -hmm. uh, the firemen's dances, Constantly festivals. you know, all of that. And it's so kind of rich. Each one has a queen. Yeah. And princess. Oh, that's right. You have the dairy queen. And junior princesses. And, <laughs> in, in Iowa, I have to say this, my wife won, I was the, not the dairy queen, but the Iowa corn queen. Of course, yeah. And her brother told us once. quite an honor. <laughs> her brother said the only thing more embarrassing than being in the running for the corn queen is winning the corn. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. No, but I think for a lot of us in the rural community, it's kind of an instant in to, to the world of that, mm -hmm. the world of your novel, right mm -hmm. away. And, uh, which is why I love your writing so much. I really uh, just, not so much painting the picture, but how, uh, how I can so easily get into that world. Mm -hmm. Um, which is fine. And then we keep coming back to it, and, you know, as chapters take us out, then we come back to it and still. So it's, it's a, a wonderful um, um, conceit in, in the book. Sadly, all those parades and festivals are canceled this year. So I know. I read the local paper and it's just one after another. It's yeah, the parade you have in there. They're such a big part of the community. There. Oh, yeah. You describe exactly the parade we had down the street right here with the tents <laughs> tossing candy to the yeah. kids. Right. Um, I'm from New York originally, so when I first came here 26 years ago, um, I was like a kid because I was fascinated by it all. And, and, mm -hmm. and, and were you running out and grabbing candy? No, we never, we never did. Yeah. <laughs> when you got here, I mean, when I got here, yeah. yeah. But I'd never seen anything like that before. Yeah. I'd never seen a, I'd never seen a deer hanging upside down in somebody's garage. Sure. Right? And You're never right. ate venison and mm -hmm. never seen a turkey fly across the road. I didn't know turkeys could get off the ground. <laughs> um, but I love that. I love uh, both in both my books. I use local geography too, and fictionalized. But like I have very vivid images. Because is that for you? I mean, uh, yeah. usually when I'm reading, I need 
oh yeah a I have movie to, in my head I yeah call. I have to see it and, and um, I think you know what I love about the Driftless area and the, is is the geography and yeah. the fact that it's it's um, it's very rugged it's beautiful it's it's un, sort of unexpected in the Midwest um, yeah um, it sort of comes up out of nowhere as you head west from spring green um, yeah and yeah, I see it very, very clearly. I spend a lot of time out there and um, think that the landscape itself determines the culture in a lot of ways. Um, yeah. You know, it's, uh, it's been difficult to farm out there. I think a lot of the family farms out there failed probably because they're smaller, because of the landscape, you know, limits their size. And um, there's an influx of the CAFOs, the factory farms that are coming in on the big ridges and um, so yeah the landscape out there is really a determiner of the, of the culture and the people who live there and it, just as a writer I think it's such rich material to kind of set the movie going in your head you know mm -hmm. return to it um, I had a lot of fun in Winston which I have a detective from Chicago who comes to a small yeah. world so there's a lot of fun with it's that. great to bring an outsider in. that's a very helpful <laughs> yeah. thing for me to you know part of my to the extent that I have a formula um, Part of my formula is to always have a character who is new, or an or an outsider to the bad acts, and who that which allows me to describe it. Yeah, through those eyes, and it's very, very useful. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, having it sound like exposition, how do you yeah. get that right. you know, across through action or dialogue, right. which is always a challenge. Um, but um, uh. Yeah, that, well, I'm, as they were saying earlier, I'm working on a, a second in the series with the same detective, and I have had him move to Wisconsin now. Oh, you did? Yeah. This well, why? Something, well, in, in the in the first book, not giving it away, but he gets shot at the end, you know, yeah, right. so he's like, incapacitated, so he can't work as a police officer anymore. Oh, so he has, interesting. He has to leave the force, and his daughter lives in Wisconsin in the first book. So she lives in Milwaukee, right? She's yeah, a police she's, a, she's a cop in Milwaukee. In Milwaukee right. yeah. So he's moved out here, so um, I'm... I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> yeah, so, so you get to fun. describe Wisconsin through his eyes. Yeah, so yeah. it's fun. Uh, yeah. uh, and how he learns to start appreciating some of the things that he's never yeah. seen before. He's never yeah. seen the, the, you know, the Driftless area. And it's a process. I moved here in high school from the state of Oregon, from the West Coast, and I didn't know what I was looking at. It took me, honestly, I wasted 10 or 15 years before I realized there was good fishing here. <laughs> because, I, you know, my, my orientation from being a, a West Coast person was snow melt and, and mountains and, and you know rivers that flowed real fast and I was looking at all this still water and I couldn't figure it out. It yeah. took, took me forever just to adjust to the landscape. Yeah, I, I was telling you earlier we were talking fishing, the same thing I had to relearn. I didn't know what, what lures right. to use. I'd look at sure. old timers and try and see what, they, <laughs> what knots they were using. And, uh, oh, we're talking about fishing now. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, maybe I'll get him fishing in the next book, maybe. Um, Good idea. I have them out to go out to Bad Axe and meet, yeah. meet Heidi. Yeah, well, see Heidi. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so um, uh, when, when is it? So we've got a third one coming out? Yeah, the third one will be out about a year from now. Mm -hmm. it's, okay. Yeah, the third one is um, called From Hell Hollow. From Hell Hollow. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I, I meant to tell her I had something for you. I, was, uh, I watched an uh, interview with Doug Moe the other night. Oh, and, um, right. Uh, be honest about that because I'm new to your books, which is kind of fun. Doing his research, yeah, it's fun meeting a new a new author, to turning on, being turned on to a new writer. And so, yeah. um, but you saying you were you mentioned a book that was on my shelf. Really? What are you talking about? When you were, you were younger and you used to write, uh, you you, uh, you like reading when you were a kid. Yeah, when you were writing. Yeah. But you mentioned. Um, oh, you've got blueberries for sale. <laughs> <Sarah. laughs> yeah. So what I said in the, in the in the performance of the Zoom thing the other night was that my I, I wrote my first book at about age six and it was blatantly plagiarized from blueberries for sale. They might have been blueberries for how. I mean, <laughs> there yeah, you it was go. that you close. <laughs> <laughs> I remember, you know, with a colored pencil drawing in the little blueberries. And everything. But yeah, I was I was yeah. a reader and my mom was a reader, um, and I at some point started kind of swiping her. She was. She read genre fiction. I remember she read like Harvey Kellerman and uh, mm -hmm. John D. McDonald and these sort of thriller writers. And I would pick those up and read them when I was too young to understand them. <laughs> uh, yeah, one, one of my favorite things to do is to either read the Paris Review interviews or watch uh, interviews with writers like yourself the other night. And then listen to the books that you found interesting that influenced you, yeah. and then get those books. And then get those books. So yeah. I just ordered. I just ordered Brown Dog and Child oh, of God and Flaubert. 
Oh, excellent. You mentioned those. Yeah, so. yeah. Before you read Clover, maybe you should read um, Mink River. Mink River, I said. It kind of sets up Clover. The character in the Clover um, is, a, is a character out of Mink River. And uh, oh, really? you get to know him first in, the Plo yeah. in uh, Mink River, and then he, he sets sail in a, in a fishing boat across the Pacific. That's, no, that's, I, I that's the point. I have to read it now. Yeah, you'd, you'd really like the Clover, I think. Yeah, it's funny because you know I know Harrison, I know Cormac McCarthy, read it, but every once in a while you find a book that you haven't read. In a nutshell, mm -hmm. I read Nutshell last year, which oh, is pretty nice. Yeah. Where did you get the idea to go from that point of view? And, and pull it off. I know. Yeah, I know. He's amazing. Yeah. I read his, uh, well, when I read Atonement, I've read a few of, early, mm -hmm. of his early works, then I read Atonement, which for me was just felt like a quantum shift yeah. in something in his yeah. writing. And it was one of the first authors to see McEwen, then I went back and I read everything that he wrote. Yeah, I'm getting there. Yeah, yeah. but it's pretty fast. It's for me, I'm, uh, it's, I, his range fascinates me. Where he started I mean, with Where he gets from atonement to nutshell to yeah. what's the one that won all the prizes? Uh, Amsterdam. Um, yeah. Yeah. Just everything's so different. Chilton Beach. Uh, Chil Chilton. And Chilton. Chilton. And, and the early ones, those little macabre. Uh, he's got some really odd, dark, dark. Oh, uh, very early works. But. Yeah, I'm on his trail. I've, I've, yeah. I've got him on my list, too. Yeah. It's fun, yeah. So, last night, folks, I read A Winsome Murder oh. by James DeVita. I mean, I read the whole damn book in one sitting. It was great. Oh, did he? Uh, yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it was yeah. outstanding. I'm flattered that you liked it. Um, I, I hope. So, you're, you're, you're working on a sequel or you have one done? Or, or? I'm about, I'd say, Ooh, I'm, I'm thinking maybe 30, 40 pages from the end. Oh, that's the best part. It should yeah. be going downhill right I now. I can see it, you know, yeah. I can start yeah, to see like it now. That in a day is just how to bring it across. <laughs> it finally gets some momentum, you know, those last, yeah. when they get closer to it. But, right. uh, it, uh, it is the same detective, Detective James uh, uh, Mangan, who has now moved to Wisconsin. So um, there's a lot of uh, uh, local interest um, in it. Too. I'm looking forward to that. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm hoping to finish, well, I was going to finish, I, I'm sorry, I, had a, I got a job down in Florida this year, and I, it was a relatively easy schedule, uh, a theater job, and I had planned on going to finish the book when I was down there, mm -hmm. but there's really good fishing in Florida, <laughs> yeah, I know and I wound fishing. up fishing every day, I did not write a page, I wound up fishing almost every day when I was down in Florida, oh. so um, I confess that, and, but now I have no excuse. Um, but it's very hard. I don't know if you've ever had to. Get, I often have to step away from my books for a while to do my day job. Um, I, I, yeah. When it's getting very busy, and it's incredibly hard for me at this time getting back into a mystery thriller. I literally forgot who knew what. Oh, and the yeah, little I things can imagine I that from from your from your plot here. There's a yeah. lot of moving parts. And, um, yeah, I think it took me a good month of just rereading and rereading chapters and going back and finding it till I had it in my head. Well, again to move forward it's kind of scary yeah, yeah. you better finish that thing <laughs> before something else happens yeah but, um, yeah but yeah i hope that my goal is to finish uh, uh early fall do you have a title for that one yeah it's called indifferent red indifferent red interesting indifferent red it's from, why why winsome why, where did you come up with winsome Wins it's a it's um um, well, of course, I wanted to play on on Winsome on this, um, and the, the publisher was not crazy about that at first because they didn't want to be to be taken as a. I forget the name of it. Like some of the British, they thought it may just sound too light. Like yeah. uh, I forget the name of. Well, the, yeah, well, we think about what Winsome means. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I was hoping that the cover would <laughs> juxtaposed against that. <laughs> But it's actually, you know, it came, this is a long, long time ago. I got the, the original idea was many years ago. I was on tour uh, with a show up in Whitewater. And we used to drive in buses, the tours and stuff like that. And we had to go to a place around Adams County. And I didn't know where it was. I asked somebody on the map and they said, it's just below Friendship. And I thought, what yeah. a great title, just yeah. below Friendship. Yeah. Friendship. And I had this idea of a town called Friendship. Right. And uh, the, the title was in there for a while, eventually went away from that as it does, but it started okay. with that. With friendship. friendship led to something yeah. else. Yeah. Then I fictionalized it. And then I started researching a lot of strange stuff was happening up in Adams County area too when I started researching. Is that Ed Gein country? Um, what's that? Is that Ed Gein country? Yes. Yeah. yeah. You know what I'm, yeah. I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. um, so that, that, that was an, an, uh, an early take on that. And, and pretty much, a lot of times I'll start with using actual names and then I get into the book about eight months. I start going back and fiction. Yeah, I kind of do that. I, I, I do that. I, I, sort of have, I sort of have the placeholder name. 
Yeah. And then the, the name that mm-hmm. comes in in the fifth or sixth draft and yeah. becomes the official name. Yeah. So it's pretty mm-hmm. real for me. Like in the silence, we have some things that <clears throat> is absolutely Madison in my head, but I just call it the capital in the book. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, I'm not too far. There's a town called Spring Valley as opposed to Spring Green. Okay. So there's, that's not a big stretch. But, right. um, so you like using, um, and this is where you fish too, the people that don't up in, in Bad Axe. Uh, yeah. County around there? Yeah, fishing yeah. in that general area. Yeah. yeah. Can't tell you exactly where. <laughs> <laughs> You'd have to shoot me, right? Yeah. Can't tell you. Okay, we have, we have just a few minutes left, so can I ask you a few questions? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Happy to. Um, the Winsome Murder, um, at which uh, you put out, you came out five years ago or so. Uh, yes. And I just discovered yeah. yesterday and read in one sitting. Um, stars a uh, detective named James Mangan, who um, is a Shakespeare, <laughs> yes, what would you call him, expert, fanatic, he's got a, he's read all the plays many, yeah, he, many, many times and remembers. Yeah, he's got too much time to himself, I think. <laughs> yeah, he's kind of a lonely guy. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I was fascinated by that, um, and I've, I've, I, I've been trying to find this page that, and I can't find it, but I, at one moment in there he talks about Titus Andronicus, and he gives some statistics oh, yeah. about the amount of crime in that play. Do you yeah. were, can you can you re- find that or recite I can't it? recite it, but it's it's something like there's you know three beheadings, fourteen murders, two rapes, a cutting out of a tongue, and two hands cut off. Yeah, that sounds about. <clears throat> right. It's something like that. That's not exactly it, but uh, right. So <clears throat> and it and it really reminded me from you know that Shakespeare is incredibly bloody stuff. Yeah, um, and. Um, the theme in this book is revenge, which is yeah. also a major theme to a lot of Shakespeare's plays and so forth. And so I'm, I'm curious to know from your standpoint, how I, I get that your, that your, that your character, um, he lines from the plays float through his head and sort of inform him as he goes about solving the crime. That's fascinating. How about the story itself and the plot and so forth? Were you influenced by it in a particular play or by uh, any anything structurally or thematically that you for this the, the story of yeah the, <clears throat> not too much I, this may sound silly to you but I was trying to you know think of what to write about you know I was a, you know I had daydreaming about a number of things and I read something about I think I almost positive it was F Scott Fitzgerald in a letter to a friend who was having trouble with his novel and he said well drop the dead body in there get alive and things right? and um, and I know it sounds funny, but uh, and I used, I used to jog before I had back problems. I used to jog here every morning in the in the fields out here behind uh, the Ring Brothers. For those of you that know, there's it's deserted back there, and there were no houses, just fields. Mm-hmm. And I was driving, uh, running by, and there was this one depression in in yeah. the soy field. I remember that image from your book. Yeah. And I couldn't get rid of that image. And I'd try yeah. by it every, every day. I would jog jog by it, and my my brain started to go, mm-hmm. and it. It was just how did the depression get there? Because there was no road into it. Mm-hmm. You know, it was like 30 feet from the road. And my weird brain said, what if that was a body that you couldn't see? Yeah. <clears throat> and that was the first impetus for, yes, for the story. And I'm not really a crime writer, a crime reader of books. I really never, I started to once I got on this. Right. Um, but so that's, so that's, a, that's the question that I was going to ask you. How did you get started? You got started from that image in the field? That's how you thought, well, why don't I write a murder mystery? Yeah, well, I, every time, well, actually, a friend of mine, Sarah Day, it was a few things that I, uh, she's a wonderful actress out here and a dear friend. Um, I was frustrating writing books for uh, my, my young adult book, wasn't going very well, so I was a little frustrating. I wanted to try something different. And uh, she said she knew of an actor somewhere, a film actor that was, on, when you're on film, you're on set for a long time and hours of doing nothing and always used to write these little murder mysteries. Mm-hmm. And she said, why don't you write one? And I said, yeah, yeah sure, I wish I could. And uh, my wife half joked and they said, because my other books did not do particularly well. And she said, why don't you like, try and write something that sells? And joke, jokingly, she said, why don't you write like, an erotic thriller or something like that? Yeah. You know, with some, you know. So I started toying with those ideas and then, so the real genesis happened was when I got the idea, okay, right now I'm kind of a frustrated children's book writer, so why don't I write about a frustrated children's book yep. writer who hears about a murder, tries to transform and her career, transform her career and try yep. and write something salacious with a little sex in it, some violence, yep. and maybe offend some people and it would really sell, right. get mad. You know? And that was the original idea and I, 
it was a lot of fuel for my brain. <laughs> yeah, I can tell. It's a great book, folks. I and mean, if you haven't read *It Once and Murder*, I recommend it. I, I couldn't put it down. It was really, yeah, thank really you. a pleasure to, to encounter this. And *Maddox County* and *Dead Man Dancing* just came out. Please uh, get your copies. It's a uh, wonderful book. So, thank you. This was thanks. Yeah, yeah thanks, Jim. It's great to meet you. Yeah. I've been admiring your work on the stage for years. Oh, so it's thank great you. to meet you in person. You, you too. It's kind of unfair that you can also write novels. But, <laughs> oh well. <laughs> Do you have a question? Um, Do you have a question regarding? Oh, from from the audience? Yeah. No, I don't. Oh. That's a one already. My question is: Is the county board chair based on anyone real from the area? No. No comment. <laughs> no, comment. <laughs> no. I, I I I've had those kinds of questions before, and and absolutely not. I'm not putting real people in my books. Period. Um, now realistic people different so um, hopefully this question came up because there's somebody who a character who is realistic but no I don't I don't put uh, innocent actual humans in my in my books thanks for the question it's a good one <laughs> hey, we, we have an audience request that both of you read a bit of your books okay so we didn't give you a warning about that <laughs> no so warning for that you might want to pick something up Wait, just maybe like for 30 seconds or something? Well, a couple of minutes, whatever. A passage that you think might enlighten people what the book's about. Okay. And you probably have something to fix since you've made. Sorry? I said you probably have something to mm -hmm. fix since you've been. Yeah, in all fairness, have to. the authors did not know that this question was going to be asked. Okay, <clears throat> I'm going to read something from the um, prologue to Dead Man Dancing, which is the second in the series. And um, the scene uh, behind this is the sheriff kick is, has a day off, which is very rare. Um, she's at the first farmer's market of the season uh, with her kids. It's cold, it's nasty, the wind's blowing sleet sideways, but it's happening anyway. And um, <clears throat> there's a polka band um, trying to whip up a little enthusiasm, um, but her kids are getting cold. Uh, and so she takes them inside the public library to warm up. She wasn't done with the market yet. She wanted to look at Hans Lapp's birdhouses made from gourds, but she took the kids inside the library so that Opie could warm up. She sat in a comfortable armchair between the children's books and the window. The sudden warmth made her groggy. She could hear, still hear the next polka coming from Main Street, even through the window, even though the window looked out on Pool Street, one block west in parallel to Main. She found herself studying the town that was hers to take care of. Establishments along Pool Street mingled rundown old farmstead with tentative new farmstead. Mindy's repair had been there forever behind its shabby front. Next door to Mindy's, Mindy's was River of Oz, something new, a freshly painted sign depicting a wizard on a flying dragon and offering body work and supplements. Then there was the Farmer's Eagles Club, Area 3409, a dull cinder block building she had visited just last week. Next door was probably the most exotic place in Farmstead these days, a dingy little grocery, Mercado Chavez, occupying a former insurance office and catering to the influx of Spanish-speaking people who mostly lived in trailers on the grounds of Vista Farms, the factory dairy operation that appeared last fall on Belgian Ridge. Staring out at Mercado Chavez, her stomach tightened. Hardly more than a cow chip toss away on Main Street, the banners read, Welcome, and we're glad you're here, but there had been friction. She had heard nasty grumbling about invasion, about speak English, about jobs stolen from locals. Not Harley, but his family, his mother Belle and his brother Kenny were of that persuasion, she knew. Pausing for these thoughts had allowed fatigue to catch her and she spent the next minute fiddling inside her coat pocket and feeling furtive. As an avowed teetotaler, nothing stronger than coffee, she had a secret. And here was one more tally to note. It had been 98 days since she had bought her first pack of Nicorette gum in the, midst, in the midst of a marathon search for a runaway junior high school boy. Before she got to day 100, she had sworn to herself she would quit. She touched the pack secreted in her inner coat pocket, but her kids had a spooky sixth sense about the presence of gum. She didn't dare. Without nicotine, she drifted, seeing her face reflected in the cold skin of window glass then she sank into sleep, and in sleep she began her nightmare again, inserting Denise's update that Harley was doing his cheating on the Ring Hollow Dam Spout, and the woman had long blonde hair. 
In the dream, it was her zeal for everybody's safety that had pushed her husband too far, created too much conflict. He was a fucker, not a fighter. She had lost her marriage. Then Opie was tugging her sleeve. What, honey? Opie said in a library whisper, Uncle Kenny just drove by with a big flag in his truck. What? That big red flag with the blue and white cross and stars on it. Uncle Kenny? He had a flagpole standing up in the back of his truck. She roused into a wakeful dread, Uncle Kenny. More often than she dared to count, Harley's troublemaking older brother had taken a piss on their marriage. Kenny kicked brawled in the taverns, trespassed and poached, yelled crude things at high school games. Always a story, always an excuse constantly putting his sister-in-law on the spot and pitting her against her husband. Most recently, back in September, she had busted in for OWI at blood alcohol level of 0 0.09, which Harley had argued was just one swallow over legal, and you're his family. As if Kenny wasn't usually a whole lot drunker behind the wheel, as if laws should not apply when one was related their enforcer. Harley had ensured her that no amount of punishment was ever going to change Kenny. Kenny's whole life history proved that shaming him would only make him worse. Here he comes again, Opie whispered. Sheriff kicked gaped in stunned denial at the old two-tone Ford pickup roaring down Pool Street, showing off windshield cracks, rust craters, a mud beard, and a statement. A, rant, <clears throat> a ranting voice inside her started inside her. God damn you, Kenny. You can't be bullying around Farmstead with a giant Confederate flag posted up in your truck box. The flag caught a cold gust and preened out perfectly behind the truck. God damn it, Harley, your dumbass brother is really not doing this to us. Then Kenny had gone past. What the hell? That's the Nazi flag, Opie remarked. No, hon, it's not, but it's a bad flag. Well, it's going around and around the block. So he was. He was flagging the farmer's market in Little Farmstead, Wisconsin, in front of mostly Amish who were immune to the politics of the English and in front of a few nice old men playing polka for the love of it, the sheriff's brother-in-law was making a display of the Southern Cross, a symbol that in the North had only one meaning. The polka stopped dead. In the quiet of the library, the sheriff could hear her brother-in-law rip snorting south to north up Main Street, revving his dirt bag engine and squealing his worn out tires as he cornered on First Street, cornered on Poole Street, and now here he came once more past the library windows, past the Eagles Club and the Mercado Chavez doing laps. Opie stomped her foot, very quietly, but with real force. Mommy, she whispered hotly, do something. So that's the end of the prologue for Dead Man Nancy. Yeah. And it's her need to do something and what she does that mm -hmm. triggers the plot. Yeah. yeah, I forgot to mention too how some of the themes are so timely in your book, both uh, immigration and racism and right. white supremacy. There's, there's, there's a lot going on in the book. Heidi's got a lot to deal with. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is just, I, f I found that, uh, that passage. Oh, did you guys? Um, it's, this is a, oh, that's a 69, a but it, it's a, I'm a okay, this is a gallery. Right. So this is just a short passage. So, uh, the, de the te detective in my book is kind of a, he's a, uh, a classical literature buff, uh, particularly um, Shakespeare and Melville, but he gets crap for it too from the guys he hangs out with usually. So, <clears throat> um, but this kind of explains that. So, uh, whenever Mangan was teased about this literary eccentricity of his, which was quite often, his stock reply was if anyone knows about murder, it's Shakespeare. And if anyone knew about Shakespeare, it was Mangan. He'd read all his plays, many of them a number of times, and he'd seen nearly all of them on the stage at one time or another. He traveled to Shakespeare festivals around the country and also to Ontario and London. He had a private goal to see all the plays acted on the stage before he died. He'd seen 33 of Shakespeare's 37 plays, if he didn't count to noble kinsman, questionable authorship. Mangan often told his water cooler hecklers about the fact that Shakespeare had written extensively about some of the most horrendous crimes imaginable. Infanticide, patricide, mutilations, tortures, cannibalism, rapes, and beheadings, to name just a few. If people continued to razz him, he liked to rattle off the following stats, at which point they usually either shut their mouths or were left with them slightly agape. In Titus Andronicus alone, there were 14 murders, six dismemberments, three rapes, and one live burial. Mangan's world. 
<laughs> I should have had you read mine. That's not fair. That's, that's a great passage. That, that was my favorite part of the book, actually, that whole thing. That was great. I had to find some way to, you know, I started doing the Shakespeare thing, and I had to say, I got to justify why the guy uses this and does this. And so, yeah, that works. But it got sold me. Well, yeah. thank you. It's a quirky, quirky little thing. Well, Jim, the question I put on your table, yeah. I think is something that both you and John could address. What's it, once a first draft is written, what's your editing and revision process? Um, I'm sure it's different for everybody, but um, I, 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 I go through tons of it. First of all, I have a reader in town who's just a wonderful reader, um, as my friend Sarah Young. And I have her read all of my early drafts, and she's very frank with me. I love frankness, it, it, it's much more efficient. Um, she's very supportive of me as a writer. So that's the, the very first earliest things. And then um, uh, I revise again and again and again. But um, the, the main thing that, I mean, after my, I have something that I feel is of merit to show someone, then I try to get a publisher. I'm not with a publishing company. I don't have an agent. Um, I wish I did. But so a lot of my work has been peddling my own work. And in the early days, I did the old fashioned way with synopsis and sample pages right. and a cover letter and uh, a lot of it is electronic now, and it's much more difficult now. Um, uh, so, um, yes, getting your editor, I report very closely with an editor. I, I, if you get a good editor, it's, for me, it's like having a wonderful teacher. I think they're trying to make the book better, and uh, it's, a, it's on its best, it's a great collaboration. Mm -hmm. But, you know, what about you, John? You, so, you know, I mean, I, I, first of all, editing and revision are very different. Yeah. Editing, yeah. editing, I don't even allow myself. On a bad day, I'm editing. Yeah, yeah. On a good day, I'm not. I mean, editing is something that for me comes very late in the process mm -hmm. after numerous drafts and pretty much even after I've had readers read. I don't worry too much about editing until I'm sure that the, you know, the content is what I want. I've got some terrific readers. I want to thank Larry Hansen and my brother Michael Galligan and my uh, agent Joanna McKenzie who all give me fantastic readings. Um, and like you say, then, then, then the book gets to the publisher and there's uh, another yeah. several rounds of revision and editing. And those uh, feedback from that from them has been outstanding as well. It goes on and on and on and on. And a book that I turn in in August is not really done until February or March mm -hmm. going through all the cycles and the proofreading and everything. So but you have a couple of private, you know, friends. Or yeah, whatever. I have some, some trusted, yeah, it's really important. trusted readers that, yeah, are terribly important for me. And, and I, editing, the, the way I edit, which might be of interest to people, is that I read out loud. I will read um, my, my manuscripts front to back out loud two or three times. Mm -hmm. um, and that's more of my final editing process. I start to hear things that are yeah. invisible to me on the page. And uh, so... Um, I would say that about 70% of what I do in the whole process of writing a book is revision and editing. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I agree. It's the same kind of, it's <clears throat> on a good day, it's just like chasing those editor voices out of That's the That's right, head. yeah. And I think one of the things that really <clears throat> boxes up potential writers is that they want to edit the first sentence yeah. and fix it and make it perfect. And, yeah. yeah. Have you ever read Bird by Bird by Anne Lamont? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I kind of have a literary crush on her. Yeah. Um, but, good uh, advice in there. Yeah. yeah. Shitty first drafts. Yep. And, yeah. and, uh, but also about permission me. to suck is how I talk. Uh, tell my students. Yeah. Yeah. Give yourself permission to suck if you yeah. have to. Yeah. Nope. Comes another question. How are you or aren't you dealing with the health and political issues in your upcoming books? Um, well, I'm, I'm really determined to, to make sure that, that my, my books are something more than crime novels and that, that they're, you know, um, they're, they're about crimes that are symptomatic of something bigger in the culture. That's not just some crazy axe murder. That's, these are crimes that are occurring because of what's going on, to, happening to all of us. So um, Dead, Dead Man Dancing is, is about uh, racism and its legacy. Um, the book that I just turned in come, called From Hell Hollow uh, is really about climate change at, at the base. It's about environmental sickness. It's about nature turning on 
human beings, at least in the view of some people. And I am working on the fourth one now, which I had to throw away all of my work because I, I had a story about a foreign exchange, a high school foreign exchange student coming to the Bad Axe and getting in trouble. And then the pandemic struck and I realized there will be no high school foreign exchange wow. students into the near future. And um, that plot wasn't gonna make any sense in a book that came out in 2021, mm -hmm. probably. So um, now I'm thinking about the consequences of what we're going through now um, without trying to predict anything at all specific, but about the psychic fallout from what we're all going through in terms of isolation, in terms of fear, um, in terms of loss of livelihood, um, those kinds of things. So I'm trying to think about what the zeitgeist is um, and, and what and how crime springs from that in the future. So I don't want to say a, lot, a whole lot more else because I'm just working on that right now. I don't want yeah. to pop the bubble. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Spook it. Yeah. It's coming away. So. Yeah, it's funny. You know, I'm, I'm revisiting because I've been working on this uh, book. I had to put it down a few times and revisiting. So I was going back. And a lot of takes, uh, some of the geography takes place in, in Madison and Milwaukee. And <clears throat> so I was just working on it just, and just visually. Madison wasn't the same anymore because right? mm -hmm. I had a character walking down State Street and it was no longer true, you know, because Boarded. where I had it boarded up went so like yeah. I said, now this feels phony, even though it's not set particularly today, but right. <clears throat> the image in my mind is different. So I went back and worked mm -hmm. that story in about some of the protests that have been happening and um, and little things like that and just um, even just it's it's funny as the world changes changes. I find my characters are thinking differently. Sure. And uh, uh, so now I'm in the process of just that, letting that in to them, basically. Mm -hmm. I find my yeah. detective, when he's struggling with things, thinking differently about the world and the way the world is, is right. today. Right. And uh, so, yeah, the, whatever the world is around us certainly seeps in. Yeah. And, and keep in mind, as readers, there's a, there's a large time lag between when we write the book and when you read it so it can yeah. be it's i don't think a good idea to try to to be very specifically yeah. timely i mean the book that i have out now from dead, dead man dancing and it's dealing with race that what happened in the last several months hadn't happened yet yeah, um, yeah. and so it's um, bad that it happened but fortuitous that the book happens to be on that theme yeah and some of it has been happening for 400 years so exactly yeah um, jim you have a question on I do, I do. I can't say anything anymore. You're a playwright. Uh, oh, for those of you who don't know, I, I'm also a playwright. I've, I've, I've written many plays, particularly for young audiences, but I've, I've written for adults too. How is it different writing for the stage uh, versus writing for prose meant to be read by an individual, watched by an artist, or read by an individual? Uh, it's kind of, yeah, I, I don't I don't feel a huge. I th I think you know particularly I'm uh, not a novice writer, but still I've three novels. I'm still learning all the time, and I think when I first started out, my dialogue was stronger than my narrative. I was very homer sure. dialogue, and there's no big mystery of that. I've been in the business, and uh, but I do feel like um, you know like allowing yourself to suck, um, as you just said, and and the mod. I I do trust that. Allow myself to be bad. And I feel it's very similar to writing for the stage or acting for the stage too. Like mm -hmm. my early rehearsals, mm -hmm. I'm pretty bad. I'm often quite bad, but nobody's seeing that. Right, you, you know, know it's, it. You know, know it. I know it. My my colleagues know yeah. it, and they trust that it's going to get better. I right. hope. I think uh -huh. the same thing with the you know reading your early drafts. That okay, I call it like 4 a.m. writing. I never write at 4 a.m. It's like what was I thinking? Yeah. yeah, some of my writing I read it the next. It's overwrought. You know, or melodramatic, but but something was coming out of me, and then the second pass through that, I'll try and clean it up. But I think the same things like both in acting and um, writing. I think if 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 it sounds authentic to you, I think that part of maybe perhaps I do a lot of reading out loud too. Mm -hmm. And there's times when I could just feel something doesn't sound authentic, and I don't always know why. Mm -hmm. And my funny, my good re the good readers that I have that work for me, they can point out something, and it's like. <laughs> I knew that, and I. Yeah. There's certain things that I think maybe 
<clears throat> I'm not like avoiding it, but I said, no, maybe that's okay. Maybe that, and then somebody would point out exactly that passage. It's, it's a layered process, you know, you see, you don't see what you don't see, and then you see it bit by bit as you go forward, and then you get the book published, and God forbid you open the book after it's been published, Yeah, <laughs> and see something that's like, no, no, it didn't, it yeah. could have been better, it's too late. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, but it's... We have one last question. I, know, I don't have the answer to it. What was the name of the slave narrative book? I don't know the exact name. I think we're talking about the same one. Can you put a name on it? I don't have a name. But it has, I believe it has those words in the title, narrative yeah. and slave. It's authentic narrative. Yeah, it's a collection. <clears throat> and um, I guess. But there's like hundreds of short narratives. Yeah, yeah. I don't know the The title is not, the title is very factual. It's not like a creative title. It's like yeah. the slave <clears throat> narratives from. Yeah. Such and such. No. But, um, so, yeah, are we still on? Are we still talking? Oh, yeah. oh, oh we're still talking. We're not any more questions. More questions. <coughs> um, um, <coughs> just, so, I have a question for you, John. Did Shakespeare ever write about fishing? There's very little. There's one play, Pericles, which I love because there are fishermen in it. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and there's actually a very small percentage of people that think he worked on a boat. Because they're trying to figure out, like Shakespeare worked on a boat, or at least make passages on, <coughs> excuse me, it's one weird, weird thing thinks he worked on one, which I just love, because it's probably not true, but I embrace it anyway. Yeah. But some of his travels <coughs> throughout the world, did he go to Italy? A lot of people think he lived in Italy and uh -huh. stuff. And so much of his, uh, his books uh, uh, have so much nautical imagery and of yeah. course that was the yeah. transportation trade. Antony and Cleopatra, yeah. right? Isn't there oh yeah, there's a tons of stuff in that. Yeah. 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 And Merchant of Venice yeah. and um, a lot of his metaphors are nautical. Mm -hmm. So I feel a little kinship there with at least Love of the Ocean. Which, which brings me a question, mm -hmm. uh, to a question from Eddie, the manager of the bookstore out in, in, in the Driftless, who says, ask him, did Shakespeare really write Shakespeare? Oh, it's <laughs> you got say, any comment on that? <laughs> yeah, say what Mark Twain used to say. Well, if Shakespeare didn't write it, then somebody called Shakespeare around it. <laughs> Good enough for me. <laughs> yeah, there's so many, you know. Uh, somebody wrote those plays, and if his name was Shakespeare, that's what I call him. And, yeah. and, and not to di uh, dismiss the argument, but I'm, really it doesn't interest me at all. Yeah. I think the works are brilliant, and, right. and not every play is brilliant, but uh, yeah. it's like that kind of obviously by the same person as well, right? Yeah, I mean, there's, yeah, they, I mean, there's it's not like there were 20 different people. Yeah. There's some hands, and think, you know, somebody right. might have, whoever might have helped with this, or but, um, but uh, most everybody agrees. But and there are very different schools of thought, and it's great. You want to argue about that? I don't. It, it just doesn't <laughs> really. It just doesn't really interest me because, for, for me as an actor too, his plays are so much work just to grasp and be able to speak hopefully with clarity and authenticity. Yeah. I don't really care who wrote it. Yeah, no, I, 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 <laughs> yeah, understand this yeah. line. But, um, yeah. Yeah, I think we're okay. We're, so we're kind of lining up, and uh, yeah, um, it's, it's been music. great. It wasn't yeah. this guy. I was a little nervous about would I be able to say anything? Cause, oh, um, but it, you're so easy to talk to, and thank you. Well, likewise, and it's a it's a real privilege to meet you. I, like I said, I've been watching you on the stage for years, and I'm gobsmacked by by your acting. And oh, thank you. You know, honestly, how you can a remember all that, <laughs> and b you know deliver it persuasively, and you know even. With with good acting, the the, the archaic English uh, becomes clear. Oh, thank you. you know, I, I'm sure you, there's a name for that in acting, but yeah. sometimes I'm not sure what the words mean. No. But the actor shows me. And that's true. Really if watch. we do our job well, that's yeah. that's the result. And sure. We try we try our best at that. So I miss the theater. I, I hope it opens I up again soon. I know. Me too. Like everything else. Um, look forward to reading the the next two in the series too. Congratulations, Dead Man Dancing, and uh, thank you. Uh, bad act. So good luck to you and good luck fishing. Thanks. Going okay. fishing tomorrow. All right. <laughs> okay. For a second. Yeah. Well, thank you, John and Jim, for sharing your time and talents with us tonight. We look forward to your future creations. <laughs> Thank you also to Nancy Bain for running the Zoom in the background, to our events manager, Katie McGrath, for helping to put this together, to my friend, Rob Steffen, for filming this evening, and to James Bone and Arcadia's owner for keeping us open but closed to the public 
than reopening safely and responsibly. We're lucky to be working and to be able to interact with so many wonderful and concerned customers from across the country. Thank you for being so supportive and appreciative in how we are operating. We'll monitor our info at Reading Utopia email for a few more minutes while John and Jim are signing books. In the meantime, a few words about the state of Arcadia that so many of you have been concerned about. The shutdown and reopening to the public has been hard on many businesses in our little village. With your help, Arcadia is treading water, but with tens of thousands of visitors to our community not here this summer, it's knocking sales down more than I would like to think about. Summer's high season in spring green, but this year isn't as much about revenue as it is about survival. When we were close to the public in person and we were just doing web and phone orders, I was frankly stunned by the numbers. It was like the floodgate had opened. Some days were even better than previous years. Your emails, phone conversations, and letters kept us going, and we are ever grateful for those things we sometimes forgot to say before the COVID times. You didn't quit us, and we have no plans to quit you. Thank you. We are humbled and inspired by your support. The majority of independent bookstores in our country are taking a hit. Some won't survive, many are downsizing. But tens of millions of our citizens are taking a hit too, and we feel that in all of our communities. If you can't afford to purchase a book right now, hopefully you'll find what you might have bought at your local public library. Arcadia Books has donated books with over $10,000 in retail value to our local library this past year. And if they can't use them, it goes into the regional library system of other public libraries. If you many and many other indie bookstores do that as well. If you can squeeze a book or two or more into your budget, making a purchase from an independent bookstore goes much farther than the sale. It supports local jobs, it supports community, and it supports literary culture that we treasure, where books are more than a commodity. My father taught me that literacy is the key to a great society. It pulled my parents out of poverty and into the middle class. If we would all read, think, and share a path forward towards a better future, we would be in a much better state than we find ourselves today. We're all in this together. We, not me. Thank you for sharing your time with us tonight. And in the future, taking the time to go to the Arcadia Books YouTube site to hear from a growing collection of authors. Be well, be safe, be smart. And in honor of Heidi Kick, it's now time to chew a square Nicorette, crack a cold one, and finish reading Dead Man Dancing. Join me. I don't recommend the Thank Nicorette. Thank you. A good night. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Well said. <laughs>